Hello and welcome to this review of my Model F reproduction keyboard, easily one of the most requested videos in the history of the channel. Just to be clear, this was not a donation, but it did get a pretty nice discount. I got into it pretty late, at a point when I thought the project would close soon, namely <laughs> November of 2018, <laughs> and I got it in June 2021. Yep, it's taken a while. <laughs> This project was the brainchild of Joe Ellipse Strandberg, starting way back in 2015, as announced on Desk Authority. The repros had been shipping out for a while, in truth, but I ordered one with keycaps and printed ones at that, and an ISO layout, and all of these factors made it take longer to make. Ones without keycaps or with unprinted keycaps, as well as ANSI ones, had already been sent out a while ago. But as you can see, I've done this properly, and I'm glad I did, because the keycaps are actually an important part of the story, but I'll get back to that later. Apparently, Joe's first ever keyboard was a Model F, just like one was mine as it happens, and their enduring quality inspired him to do this repro project. Although it's taken a lot of time, there were a considerable number of obstacles to overcome as it turned out, and Joe's a bit of a perfectionist, and despite having to make several major tooling investments, he's collected over one and a half million dollars in sales so far, so it seems to have paid off. The Model F, or Keyboard F as IBM themselves called it, was a series of keyboards that started production in 1981. Quite a few different Models F were produced over the years, but probably the most well-known type was this one, the Model FXT, which was the one that came with the IBM personal computer, and its exceptional quality was a not insignificant reason why it became one of the best-selling computer systems of all time. The Model F worked using buckling springs, a switch design held in almost legendary esteem, and rightly so. They're smooth, nicely mid-weight, and exceptionally crisp, which is the best word I can think to describe these. They're generally agreed by clicky switch aficionados to be among the best clicky switches ever designed. The Model F was followed by the Model M, another legendary keyboard, to which, by the way, we owe the modern keyboard layout. These slowly phased out the Model F starting in 1985, but they were built around a cheaper, membrane-based sensing assembly, which is more or less universally agreed to be less satisfying than the original capacitive design that the Model F used. The Model M does have its own benefits, most notably its much more accessible layout compared to the antiquated layouts the various Models F used, but overall I'd say the Model F was a much better keyboard. And by the way, because the Model F was a capacitive keyboard, it's got inherent N-key rollover, unlike the Model M, which was limited to 2-key rollover. Do note that on the new ones, it is artificially limited to 6-key rollover by default to maintain compatibility with some boot modes on certain operating systems, but you can just switch it back on by holding both shifts and pressing N. The Model F Joe used as the basis for his project was the 4704 series, which was a line of banking terminals produced by IBM in the 1980s. He probably chose this for two reasons. First, the layout on those was relatively modern among the various models F, and second, it had the most impressive build quality out of them all. I've done a whole video on the entire Model F series where I describe all of them in detail if you're interested, but I'll keep it limited to the 4704 series here for the sake of brevity. Originally, the series consisted of four types, the Model 100, which was a 50-key macro pad, basically, the Model 200, which was essentially an old 60%, the Model 300, which was pretty much the same except with an additional block of macro keys on the right, and the Model 400, which was an expanded executive model vaguely similar to a full size. Joe opted to make repros of both the Model 200, better known as the F62 or Kish Saver, and a Model 300 or F77, somewhat repurposed as a TKL. Well, it's not really a TKL because it's got no F keys, but you get what I mean. Anyway, that's the one I opted for myself. They're available in a variety of colors, including beige, black, industrial gray, silver gray, and even red, but I went for classic beige. You can get multiple colors of keycaps as well, and ANSI, ISO, HHKB, and different languages, so there is quite a bit to choose from. Both models start at $355 for a bare-bones kit, which is remarkably similar to the original price in 1982, when a brand new Kish Saver cost $340. Although if you adjust that for inflation to 2021, it's actually more like $940, which is a nowadays pretty inconceivable amount of money to spend on a keyboard. Well, unless you're into beam springs, of course, then it's a pretty good deal. 
<laughs> Although all Models F sported absolutely outstanding build quality with full steel chassis, the 4704s were the only ones with full metal housings as well. Many Models F only had a steel back panel, but the 4704s came with a thick cast zinc alloy housing. This made them virtually indestructible from a mechanical point of view and absurdly heavy as well. No, <laughs> I mean, seriously, you wouldn't believe the weight on this motherfucker. Yeah, applesauce, bitch! You can tell it's a design from an era in which electronics were not yet considered disposable. This re <laughs> repro feels like a lead fucking brick. And remember, it's not even full size. In fact, it's got fewer keys than a TKL. It weighs slightly under 4 kilos, or 923 Zolotnik in Imperial units. Russian Imperial units. I actually have an original IBM Model 400, or F107, here. The custom industrial paint job is from a restoration I did on it. It's one of the most beastly keyboards in my possession. At 4.8 kilos, it's the fifth or so heaviest keyboard I own. But this one is, of course, a lot bigger than the F77, being a battlecruiser. Specifically, it's about 55.5 centimeters long, or 1.85 triers in Persian Imperial units. Anyway, this is a great way to compare the Repro F77 to an original 4704. I must admit, being a fan of big keyboards, I was disappointed that Joe decided not to make repros of the F107 as well, and I've been told that that's definitely not going to happen in the future either, but I guess the project took long enough already with just these two models. Just to compare it quickly to a modern TKL, here's a Ling Bao. I somehow end up pulling this thing out of the cupboard whenever I just need an average modern gaming TKL keyboard. Like all modern keyboards, pretty much, it's mostly made out of plastic, so it flexes like this, and it sounds hollow. This thing doesn't flex at all, not the slightest, tiniest bit, which is more amazing than you realize. Even a battleship flexes more than you would think. And second, it doesn't sound hollow because it's so fucking hard that it barely makes a noise when you knock on it. Also, be careful, you might hurt your knuckles. So first off, please note that although it's marketed as a reproduction, it's not actually a one-on-one -on -one copy. The layouts were changed slightly to more closely conform to modern standards. Protocols were changed because the original was a proprietary machine and not universal like USB. And some other things were changed as well that I'll get to in a minute. But in any case, it's not and is not meant to be an exact duplicate. The first thing we're going to take a look at is the build quality. It appears to be dimensionally identical to the original. It comes with a similar nice textured paint job, and it's got the very helpful pencil tray at the top here as well. That's what this is for those who are wondering, by the way. Furthermore, like the original, it uses a cast zinc alloy housing and a steel assembly, but it's actually 680 grams heavier than the original. This is partly because the housing is a fraction thicker, four millimeters in total, but most of all because it uses a higher grade zinc alloy than IBM originally used, which I've been told adds significant heft. Now, that sounds a bit weird to me. I can't imagine a difference in alloy composition being responsible for that huge an increase in weight, but hey, I measured it and it's there. I can't imagine what the F107 would weigh if they had made it in the same way as this repro, by the way. Just for reference, the housing alone weighs more than two and a half kilos. Now compare that to the Ling Bao I showed earlier, which weighs less than 750 grams in total, including the cable, and you can see that we're not dealing with just some keyboard over here. And the Ling Bao isn't even that particularly crappy a keyboard or anything, it's just average, just a standard cheap mech keyboard from China. The F77 actually weighs roughly the same as two mid-gen IBM Model M keyboards, which are themselves tanks among keyboards, or slightly more than a Kalashnikov assault rifle. Well, this is not a real Kalashnikov, it's an airsoft replica, but you get the idea. Anyway, I really can't stress enough just how much of a powerhouse this thing is, especially for its size. The cable is a bit different as well, of course. Instead of a beige serial cable, the Repro instead comes with a very long braided cable, and it's USB, of course, too, so it's actually usable on a modern computer. I like this cable. It's not as rigid as some other braided cables are, so it doesn't get in the way despite its generous length, about 2.8 meters. 
or 12.61 palmi maiores in Roman imperial units. Note that it's not detachable, but to be fair, neither were any of the original Model F cables. Well, it is detachable from the controller on the inside, of course, but not from the case. It comes with stick-on cork feet that you have to deploy yourself, but you can also get other types of feet for it, like these rubber ones, and even screw-in tall ones, which you're going to need if you want to use the keyboard at an angle, because it doesn't come with extendable feet of its own, just like the original. But I appreciate the inclusion of the cork ones, because those were the ones that the XT keyboards also used, so I stuck those on. Nice. Overall, the build quality is impressive even for a Model F. It's so heavy and strong that it feels almost otherworldly when compared to a normal modern TKL. If you're used to modern mechanical keyboards, even premium brand ones, this will feel quite unlike anything you've ever tried. I'd say this is enough to give Korean customs a run for their money. And remember, it doesn't cheat with brass weight inserts in the back or anything either. Next, the switches. Now, this is really the heart and soul of a Model F, of course, the capacitive buckling spring switches. These actually have surprisingly tight manufacturing tolerances, by the way. They feel delicious, but how do they compare to an original Model F? Well, first let's talk about smoothness. Now, I'd say that for clicky switches, smoothness isn't as important as it is for linear switches, nor is it as easy to get an accurate feel for, but it's still an important thing to look at. So I dug out my other models F and I did a comparison. Now I had to really dig down into it, testing it right beside them and going back and forth between different models. And it was slightly smoother than some and slightly less smooth than others. Like I said, it's a bit hard to get a really accurate feel for, especially because it's not always 100% consistent across these boards. But overall, I'd say they score pretty much on par with the older Fs. Not better, but not worse either, which to be clear is very high praise. It binds a little bit less than a real F as well, which is good, but that's probably due to the massive age difference. Most importantly, however, it has unmistakably captured that same crispness of key feel, that mild but sharp tactility and that nice medium stiff weighting that fits clicky switches so well. In fact, it seems to be even lighter than an old Model F, and it doesn't have an extra stiff spacebar like some Fs have, which is good. It's very satisfying, quite the step up from something like Cherry Amex Blue. I think Richard Hunt Harris, the inventor of Buckling Springs, would be proud. Some people have complained about the spacebar being rattly, and yeah, it kind of is, really. But to be fair, so is a real 4704. And in fact, despite obviously being quite loud, I think it sounds very full, almost like a tiny shotgun. It's not silent, but it's pretty satisfying, I'd say. There is documentation on how to fix the rattliness, though, for if you want to get rid of it. The sound is also very like a Model F. It's got that unmistakable super loud twang to it that allows you to instantly recognize that you're dealing with capacitive buckling springs. It's like Clint's intro, you know, you immediately know that's a Model F. It's actually so loud that you may have difficulty understanding videos or whatever if you're typing at the same time. But personally, I'd say if you go clicky, go loud or go home. To get really deep into this territory, the pitch isn't quite the same as my original 4704 Model 400, it's a bit higher pitched. It's probably caused by the smaller yet more rigid chassis, and it's got a flatter tone to it. The original kind of sings, so to speak, the note goes up a bit over time, whereas the repro holds a steady note. I think it's because the springs in the original aged non-homogeneously, so the material isn't the same everywhere along the length of the spring, and that's causing the variety of frequencies that you hear. Plus, the tightness of the assembly probably has something to do with it as well. It really depends on which of the two you prefer, and you probably won't notice too much of this when actually using it, but I thought you might find that interesting. Please note one thing, although it's very well packaged, it's not unheard of for Model F keycaps to partially dislodge during shipping, and if you reseat them improperly, they will not click or function. To reseat them properly, you have to keep the keyboard like this, so that the springs align better with the pre-angling peg inside the keycap. 
Now, mine was in perfect working condition straight out of the box as it happens, but I've heard of some others that had this. And there are some other out of the box issues as well, although Joe has provided pretty detailed documentation on how to fix these. They're not unknown issues for a Model F, let's put it like that. The keycaps are also an interesting point. They're thick, die-sublimed PBT, of course, as you'll be used to from IBM keyboards, and single-piece, just like the originals, but the ones he got in from Unicomp originally were far below par, as he wanted to get ones comparable in quality to those produced during the XT era, when the tooling was still fresh. These XT-type keycaps had razor-sharp lettering that was noticeably better in quality compared to keycaps used on later keyboards, such as the Model M. Plus, Unicomp are fairly notorious for producing keycaps with misaligned legends. But eventually he had them made third party, and these are super high quality. The lettering is just as sharp as those on an XT keyboard, and they're aligned perfectly. Definitely worth a year or so of extra time he stuck into that, I reckon. I think the only one on this keycap that's made by Unicomp is the ISO Enter key, for which he didn't have a separate mold made, which is fair enough, I reckon. Doesn't look too bad anyway. I like that he went with the same terminal style caps lock symbol too, just like on the original, and it also comes with the same blank keys between the modifiers, although those aren't stepped like they are on the original, but whether you think that's a disadvantage or not is very subjective. I would have liked a stepped caps lock key though. Interestingly, the keycaps also have a very nice texture. It's not quite the same as an old Model F's, it appears to be noticeably coarser and drier, but it's definitely just as good. You get a bunch of extra keycaps with it as well, which is pretty cool. So for example, I went with a nav cluster on the right side, but it includes keycaps for multiple numpad layouts, so you can relay it with a navless layout instead and rebind the switches. In fact, it's fully programmable, so you can program whatever you want in it. And the keycaps are uniprofile, so you can stick them wherever you want without them looking out of place, which is one of the Model F's nice advantages. And speaking of the programmability, this is where the biggest weakness of the board lies, in my opinion. It's preset for use with QMK, but QMK is a terrifyingly loathsome piece of software that only major tech nerds can wrap their heads around, and it's pretty much a total Pandora's box for anyone not used to routinely hacking a few governments during lunchtime or something. I wouldn't be surprised if IBM's original configuring software from the 1980s was easier to use than it. As such, the keyboard is intended to be used with VIA, which is a kind of extension for QMK with a more user-friendly interface. But the boards aren't set up with VIA firmware, so you'll have to download the QMK toolbox anyway and use QMK to flush the keyboard with VIA firmware appropriate for the type and model you have before you can use VIA. Now, there is a manual for doing this, but it's really vague, has no pictures, and it didn't work at all for me. It's confusing and it leaves out multiple critical details that can really fuck you up, as it did with me. Frankly, it looked like it was the manual for a completely different program altogether. So after about an hour of fruitlessly trying to even get started with this, I was so livid and seething with rage that I was pretty much just ready to throw the whole keyboard out the window and demand my money back. In the end, it took a one and a half hour screen share session with a veteran QMK user and fuck knows how many different manuals all telling you to use different files just to get the right firmware on it and get VIA going. By the way, thanks again for that, Beta. VIA itself is much more intuitive when you actually do get it going, even though it appears that you can't program any languages other than American into it. If you look closely, you'll see that the only keys you can pick from are ANSI, and I can't program even a simple UK ISO layout in it. So if you're using anything non-American, well, fuck you, I guess. To add insult to injury, Joe is very hands-off about the whole programmability thing. He just copy-pasted someone else's condensed QMK instructions on his own website and just tells you to ask any questions on desk authority instead. Plus, the instructions are very third-party. Go there, look this up, download on GitHub, join DT, PM this person and ask for access to QMK, those sorts of things. It's pretty unprofessional in my opinion. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand why Joe used QMK as developing proprietary configuration software would have made this a much more complex project, and it requires a different expertise as well, so I understand he went with existing known software packages instead, especially as QMK can apparently auto-calibrate the Model F sensing assembly, which is a big plus. 
but I must admit, I really hate it. I think QMK is worse than Corsairs and Razer software packages put together 10 times over, and the fact that he didn't even bother to write a detailed, easy to use, specific manual himself, or provide some sort of Model F specific prefab download package that actually does work, just doesn't feel right. I mean, QMK is really not something you can just get up and easily do if you have no experience with this sort of thing. And remember that he doesn't even provide support for it himself. You're supposed to go to Desk Authority and ask there. I'd say it's by far the least polished aspect of the keyboard. A major negative, if I'm honest. In its current state, I wouldn't have marketed this keyboard as being fully programmable by GUI. At best, maybe just QMK compatible or something. I mean, how the fuck am I supposed to know that this unmentioned, nondescript box is where you select the firmware file, or that you're supposed to use the ATmega32U2 type instead of the ATmega32U4 it was on originally? I mean, I don't even know what any of these are. Or that the Model F isn't in this giant keyboard model selection list. Or which of these firmware versions and layout files I'm supposed to use. I mean, seriously, you take a fucking guess. Is, is it this one or that one? or I mean, what's the difference even? Well, whatever you picked, you're wrong. It's actually none of them. In fact, one of them, I think it was the 0 to 9 ones, removed the ability to put the keyboard into bootloader mode because it unbound the right shift key, which you need to enter bootloader mode. And then Via kept giving errors to all the layout files we tried and it kept hanging on the loading screen forever until I happened to find out accidentally that you can't use it when your keyboard is plugged into a USB hub. And I mean, none of these things are mentioned anywhere. So yeah, I was pretty pissed off. A small update during the editing of this video in response to my comments about the programmability, Joe did make an instructional video on how to program the keyboards. Now I haven't had time to look at it myself, but he clearly took the comments very seriously. I really did want to do some reprogramming though, not just because I wanted to try it out to see how easy it would be, but also because the default layout is rather strange. Most notably, the right control key isn't actually control like it says, it's the function layer key, which you use together with the number keys to access the missing F keys, for example. Which is weird, I think it would have made much more sense if they had made this the FN key and this a normal control key. So instead, I rebound both of these blank keys to FN keys. By default, the left one is bound to a Windows key and the right one to numlock of all things, which seems like a bizarre choice for a keyboard without a numpad, but whatever. Anyway, these two keys here are unbound by default, so I made one of them an F5 key and the other an F12, as it is quite nice to have those as separate keys rather than having to use a function layer for them all the time. But that's the good thing about programmable keyboards, you can suit them to your layout needs. I just wish it wouldn't have been such a massive hassle to do so. Note that the physical layout is a bit different from the originals as well. You can order it in ANSI, ISO and an HHKB layout with a split right shift, but the originals use the layout with a back tab and a small return key instead of an enter and a small left shift like on European layouts. I'm kind of glad they updated the enter cluster to something more modern though to be honest, because it's not an aspect I like all that much about my 107. On that one I reprogrammed both of these keys to register as an enter key to minimize the damage. It sports compatibility with a solenoid as well, by the way. Mine doesn't include one, I didn't know you could order one with it to be honest, but it's a nice inclusion. I think Joe had some extra chunky ones made, one of which I stuck in my IBM Beamship keyboard. That thing is badass, by the way. It's basically this keyboard's big, angry, drunken father. Check out that review if you're interested. Original 4704s came with a beeper instead of a solenoid and a volume control wheel at the back, like this, but I think we can all agree that a solenoid is roughly between 100 and 10,000 times cooler than a beeper, so that's a good change, I think. Maybe I'll order one at some point, you can just plug it into the controller that comes with the keyboard by default, although I'm not quite sure where you're supposed to mount it. Overall, 
I'm very impressed. The switches, which I think were the toughest thing to measure up to, are just as good as the originals. The keycaps are just as good as XT era ones. And in terms of build quality, I'd say they're actually better than the originals. So if anything, it's surpassed the frankly huge standards it needed to meet. Plus it's got all the conveniences of a modern keyboard, such as USB connectivity, programmability, well, kinda, more modern layouts, etc. So the price for one with included keycaps is a little bit under $400, which I think is honestly a pretty good deal. I mean, yeah, it's expensive, but you're not just getting a keyboard for it. You're getting something that's way, way beyond anything that's being made today. And sure, it's more than twice the price of a Unicomp SSK, but you're getting a Model F, not a Model M, and that really means something. Besides, it actually works on boot, which, you know, is nice. <laughs> Compared to most custom keyboards, this isn't that expensive either, and even if they'll match this in terms of build quality, none of them will match this in terms of switch quality. So I definitely think that this is a very legitimate purchase. I mean, it's not flawless, the software aspect is a complete cop-out, and I really wish he would have done the 107 key models as well, because this is a little bit cramped for my tastes, but still, colour me impressed. Worth the wait. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.